So our next speaker is Dr. Sarah Nickervan. She's an anesthesiologist and intensivist from the University of Washington. She trained in anesthesiology at Washington University in St. Louis and completed a fellowship in critical care medicine and cardiothoracic anesthesiology at Stanford University, where she subsequently served as faculty and directed the critical care ultrasound training program. She's the director of point of care ultrasound and associate program director of the residency program in the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine at the University of Washington. Dr. Nickervan is a past president and chairperson for the Society of Critical Care Medicine Ultrasound Committee and Critical Care Ultrasound Course. She is a member of the National Board of Echocardiography's Exam Writing Committee and has lectured extensively, both nationally and internationally, over the last decade. Hi, my name is Dr. Sarnik Rivan, and I'm uh, really, really excited to be sharing lung ultrasound in the ICU with you here today. I'm so sorry I can't be there um, kind of more live virtually, uh, but this is a really uh, big passion area of mind, and I hope that you'll walk away from this talk with a lot of information on how to apply lung ultrasound to your critically ill patients. Now, I have no disclosures to share with you, um, and I'm hoping that we can talk a little bit about the how lung ultrasound came to be. Uh, I'll try to introduce lung ultrasound to you and share an algorithm that I use in my practice, um, and we'll, then we'll apply that algorithm to a number of different cases. Now, um, you know, it's been many years um, since uh, lung ultrasound kind of was born in a way. There was a consensus document that came out um, back in 2012. It was an international evidence-based uh, kind of guideline and recommendations for the application of lung ultrasound for a certain pathologies in particular. And um, then along the way, other studies were done looking at, um, you know, how to apply lung ultrasound to patients with alveolar interstitial syndrome. Um, this is another really nice piece uh, to review lung ultrasound in the critically ill. If you get a chance, I would really recommend reading this by kind of the godfather of lung ultrasound, Dr. Daniel Lichtenstein, um, and another really great um, review on lung ultrasound as primary survey for the acutely dyspneic patient. So there are, there are lots of studies that have been done and we're gonna share them along the way. But really um, what pathologies have, or which pathologies have been validated um, for the application of lung ultrasound assessments have been to kind of really rule out pneumothoraces, evaluations of consolidation, interstitial syndrome, and plural effusion. And so that's, we're going to try to focus on these things. This is a very broad um, category, which I'm trying to cover in 25 minutes. So um, just bear with me here as we move through it. Um, you can use any probe to do lung ultrasound imaging. I will say that if I was stranded on a desert island and there was only one probe I could take with me to do lung ultrasound, it would be this curvilinear transducer because it provides enough axial resolution for visualization of the pleural line, but also gives the appropriate amount of penetration for evaluations of consolidations and pleural effusions. The linear transducer is really great for seeing the pleural line, but unfortunately, oftentimes it doesn't allow enough depth to um, catch those other pathologies that I just mentioned. Now, anytime you scan, you have to have a scanning protocol. I predominantly practice in a cardiothoracic ICU, um, and so my patients are usually plugged up and plugged in into devices and different things, and using this um, protocol uh, that was validated back in 2005 in this bedside lung ultrasound in the assessment of alveolar interstitial syndrome um, paper is the one, this is the one that I use. So I take the chest and divide it into four quadrants during, using the parasternal long, uh, the parasternal line, the anterior axillary line, and the posterior axillary line. I'll draw a line along about T5 or the nipple line, and this will divide each section of the chest into four quadrants. This will be the right and then, of course, the left. Now, make sure that when you're doing um, your uh, imaging, you label your image because unlike cardiac imaging, lung ultrasound looks the same on both sides. So if you go back to look at it, you won't know whether you were on the right side or the left unless you labeled it appropriately. Now, what is lung ultrasound? It's really an assessment of uh, artifacts. 
And I mention this because for cardiac imaging, oftentimes we have harmonics on um, to really um, kind of, uh, in a way, diffuse out those artifacts and allow for uh, better cavity imaging. But if you did that for lung ultrasound imaging, you'd <laughs> you get rid of the artifacts and wouldn't be able actually to do your evaluation. So if you don't have a lung ultrasound preset on your ultrasound probe and you're using an echo machine to do lung ultrasound, just make sure that your harmonics are turned off when you're doing your evaluation. We're looking at the difference in acoustic impedance between air and water um, because that generates ultrasound artifact. And when there is underlying lung disease, that changes the pattern of those artifacts. And that's what we're looking for. You can see um, the bright plural line um, is uh, really about uh, typically half a millimeter below the ribs. You can see the chest wall here. Um, and I try to get this image with uh, my orientation marker pointed towards the patient's head so that I can get some ribs in my field and get a sense of where I am. So you can see here that about half a millimeter below the ribs, you're seeing this bright pleural line and it's uh, sliding kind of to and fro. This is what we call lung sliding. And you can see it almost like ant ants marching up and down as the visceral and parietal pleural slide against each other. Now, um, you can evaluate this with M mode by putting M mode across the pleural line. And when you do, as the visceral and parietal pleural rub against each other, they cause almost a smudge or this motion artifact, which makes this image look like what we call a sandy beach sign. So you're standing on the sand here and you're looking at the water. This is static chest, chest wall. Um, it's not moving really. And that's why you see kind of almost like stasis or no motion. But then once um, the pleura kind of slide against each other, you're able to see this motion artifact. This is a normal finding in normal lung sliding. Now notice here how this patient has once again, normal lung sliding. You see these B lines, which are reverberation artifacts that start from the pleural line and they go all the way down to the base of the image. And you can see this to and fro motion. But in this patient, uh, you can see here's that bright pleural line, half a millimeter below the rib. And there's really no sliding and you don't really see any B lines. And if you were to put uh, M mode over this, image, what you would end up seeing is that stasis that you saw in the chest wall, you would see below the pleural line. And this is what we call a barcode sign or a stratosphere sign. So this is really um, pretty significant for a lack of lung sliding um, and uh, something that you should do anytime that you're worried that there is not lung sliding. Now, if I say a lack of lung sliding, automatically people think of a pneumothorax, but I will say that lung ultrasound is not very specific um, when used for the evaluation of a, of a pneumothorax. It's very sensitive. You can easily rule it out. So if you put the probe on the chest and there's lung sliding, the patient does not have a pneumothorax. But if there is no lung sliding, then you have to employ a pneumothorax algorithm and look for other things. So if there is no lung sliding, you then need to look to see if there are B lines. If a patient has intact visceral and parietal pleural contact, there will be B lines and there will not, this will not be a case of a pneumothorax. But if there are no B lines, and that's once again concerning, and you're now gonna move to look for a lung point, um, which we're gonna talk about now. A lung point is really that inflection point where the visceral and parietal pleura separate from each other. This is the margin of pneumothorax. And it can be very specific if it's seen in the anterior lung fields in the presence of A lines. But please be cautious in patients who have pulmonary blebs because they have been known to mimic uh, pneumothorax uh, by causing a lung point. So you need to know a little bit about the history of your patient. Now, this is a, a ultrasonographic finding of a lung point. You can see the plural line here is gonna come up and slide, makes contact, and then it falls back um, as the patient kind of exhales. So you see lung sliding and then that lung sliding goes away. Here it is, there's the lung sliding here, and then it's gonna fall back, and then you won't see lung sliding here. Um, here's another really example, a good example with arrow markers to kind of delineate where the, that inflection point occurs. This is called a lung point. 
And when it's seen in the anterior lung fields in the absence of pulmonary blebs, it is really pathognomonic for a pneumothorax. Now, let's say you do your evaluation and you don't see a lung point. So you can't say that it's a pneumothorax. You don't see a lung point. So now you're going to look for this thing called a lung pulse. And basically, a lung pulse is the rhythmic motion of the pleura as it's adjacent to the heart. This typically is seen in patients who have poor aeration of their lungs. So maybe the lung is consolidated or you're evaluating the left chest in a patient who has a right mean main stem intubation. So basically the visceral and parietal pleural have contact with each other, but the lung is just not being ventilated where well, it's not being aerated well. And so every time the heart beats, it causes a small little pulsation of the pleural lines against each other, um, which you're seeing here. This is absent in a pneumothorax. So if you don't see clear lung sliding, but you see a lung pulse, this cannot be a pneumothorax. Once again, notice how there are these um, almost like rhythmic motion of the pleural line with the cardiac beat. There is a lot of risk for false positives when using lung ultrasound for evaluation of pneumothorax. So you can see an absent lung sliding in patients who have bad ARDS or bullous lung disease, like we just mentioned, pneumonia with poor lung aeration, fibrosis, or patients who have had pleurodeces in the past. If the patient has an acute asthma exacerbations and the lungs are just you know overinflated, that can cause poor lung sliding. If the patients have chest tubes, or if you're evaluating the apices in particular in patients on mechanical ventilation with high um, mechanical ventilatory support, high peeps, where you know you're, the, the apices just stay inflated throughout the respiratory cycle. Now, if you want to use lung ultrasound for the evaluation of con consolidation, what you're basically looking for is a tissue-like quality to the lung. We call this hepatization. So the lung will look almost, instead of that gray kind of very ambiguous appearance, it'll look like a solid organ. Oftentimes these patients have lung pulse because the lung is not well aerated, like we just mentioned. Sometimes you can see air bronchograms, both static and dynamic, which will cover. And you see this non-homogeneous distribution of B lines. This can be visualized in anyone who has a consolidated process. So maybe it's atelectasis, pulmonary infarction, lung contusion and pneumonia, cancer, you name it. So here's a patient of mine uh, in the ICU. This looks a little funny because I use the curvilinear probe. This is uh, directed towards the patient's head, but this patient was actually prone, which is why this looks so bizarre. Um, here is a, a big pleural effusion, which is a hypoechoic area of fluid surrounding this consolidated lung that looks really kind of squished down and has what we call this starry sky appearance. It looks like all these little bright points. So, so this is, um, these are, um, uh, static air bronchograms often seen in consolidated lung. But if you look really carefully here in just a second, you're gonna see these bubbles kind of come up and down um, in the airway. And this is what we call a dynamic air bronchogram. Think of it like mucus bubbling up in the bronchi. Um, this is a, a common finding in patients who have uh, consolidation secondary to uh, pneumonia. Let me show you a better example of that here. Now here's the liver. Notice how the right lower lobe of the lung looks really kind of hepatized. It looks like the liver and consolidated. And if you look here, you see these bubbles kind of moving up and down um, the airways. This is a dynamic air bronchogram in a patient with a pneumonia. So really uh, interesting uh, finding. Now, interstitial syndrome is an umbrella, and this umbrella really encompasses anything that can cause interstitial pathology in the lung. So this could be pulmonary edema, this could be interstitial pneumonia or pneumonitis, a diffuse parenchymal lung disease like pulmonary fibrosis or ARDS. This topic is a giant topic, and we could spend like an hour just on this topic alone. So um, we're going to just be very superficial about this, and I'm always happy to you know, get messages from you later if you have more questions. Now, this is an example of beelines. You see these comet tail rocket-like artifacts, reverberation artifacts. They start from the pleural line. They go from the pleural line all the way to the bottom of the screen, usually at least 12 centimeters in depth. They're laser-like. Um, and they obliterate A lines, um, which are rever reverberation artifacts of the actual pleural line that are typically seen equidistant from the pleural line. You don't really see them here because there are so many B lines that they obliterate the A line.
lines, um, and they, you see that they're moving with the lung sliding. When you see more than two of this in a field, and a field is between two rib spaces, then this is an abnormal finding and um, very um, commonly seen in patients with pulmonary edema. Now, how did we even get to do this? Well, you know, um, B lines were first seen in uh, uh, to correlate with extravascular lung water in dialysis patients. So basically they used ultrasound to assess the lungs of patients who had end-stage renal disease, um, and they did the scans before the patients were dialyzed and noticed a higher amount of B-lines. And then they did the scans again after fluid was removed or the patients got diuretics and they saw that the, the number of B-lines reduced um, in you know, both of these patient populations. So um, this is how kind of our understanding of um, using uh, B lines for the assessment of pulmonary edema kind of came to be. Now, here's an example of like a diffuse B line. So you have this relatively crisp looking plural line. You see these bright comet tail artifacts and they're kind of everywhere. There's, they're homogenous in appearance. There's no area of the lung that really looks spared. This is very classic for uh, pulmonary edema. But patients who have parenchymal lung disease can also have B lines, but their distribution is different. So, you know, there was this study that was done correlating B lines to CT findings of fibrosis. And what they found was that patients who have fibrosis end up having pleural line abnormalities, oftentimes have subpleural abnormalities, and have this very non homogeneous distribution of their B lines. And if you can look here, you can see these anterior subpleural consolidation. The pleural line does not look normal. It looks very kind of chewed up and irregular. And um, the patients have oftentimes these spared areas of normal lung. So, you know, there's these it's patchy disease process where this lung area looks pretty whited out. Um, this white lung appearance is, is really uh, um, more consistent with a patient who has some sort of underlying interstitial um, lung disease, and then they have these spared areas. This were findings that they saw in a patient with acute respiratory distress syndrome. Now, what about these studies that were done looking at um, lung ultrasound and CT and chest x-ray imaging? So this is an example. You see a relatively crisp pleural line, pretty diffuse, homogeneous B lines everywhere, chest x-ray that correlates with pulmonary edema. So this, this is a patient with pulmonary edema, but what about this one? You can see that the lung is, is diseased. There is interstitial um, process going on. The pleural line does not look normal. There are areas of spared kind of lung here um, with a non-homogeneous distribution of B-line. So this was a patient with diffuse interstitial pneumonia. What about this patient here who's on um, chest CT is clearly abnormal, very um, abnormal looking pleural line here. You have these areas of spared lung, a very non-homogeneous distribution of B-lines. This was a patient with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, now, pleural effusions are very well assessed with lung ultrasound. Actually, lung ultrasound is exquisitely um, sensitive and specific for um, diagnosing pleural effusions, much more so than even chest x-ray imaging. So here you have a patient with um, an interposition of fluid, this hypoechoic fluid between uh, the parietal pleura and the lung. And you, oftentimes you see the lung kind of consolidated, flopping around like a jellyfish um, in air quotes, um, within that pleural effusion. And you may be able to see this thing called a spine sign, which um, means that there's some pathologic process going on in the chest, which allows the ultrasound beam to get propagated forward so that you can actually see posteriorly and see the spine. In a normal chest and thorax that's filled with a lung that's filled with air, that doesn't allow the ultrasound beam to propagate. Um, and oftentimes you cannot see the spine um, in a patient who um, has normal lung um, aeration. Uh, that only really pops up once they have a, a pleural effusion or if they have a really bad consolidated lung that is hepatized and allows for the ultrasound beam to propagate forward. Now, what is this algorithm that I'm telling you about? This isn't validated. This is an algorithm that I use, but I take care of patients in the CVICU or the CTICU. So when they're coming in hypoxic and dyspneic, the first question I ask myself is, is their echo normal or not? 
If it is normal, then that's when I really move to evaluate the lung to see if there's lung sliding and what is the what are the characteristics of the B lines? Um, is are they patchy? Are they um, homogenous? Is there a pleural effusion? Can I see consolidation with static and dynamic air bronchograms or not? So let's apply this to a number of cases. So here I had a case. Uh, this was. Uh, in the uh, high high time of COVID, I'm, I'm in Seattle. Uh, we had a lot of patients who were very sick. I had a patient who was 35 year old male. Um, he was on VV ECMO for COVID pneumonia um, and he had been on it for months. Um, he was now tolerating intermittent sweep weans, um, some physical therapy. And he suddenly overnight at 2 a.m. has an acute drop in his circuit flows, becomes hypotensive, increased work of breathing despite the support of the VV ECMO circuit. Fluids are initiated and vasopressors are started and we're attempting to increase the circuit flow, but it's not working. Um, and the circuit is alarming, we can't flow. Um, so this causes a very broad differential diagnosis, right? This patient has, has pulmonary support to a certain extent, but of course um, is young and has a high demand, um, but he doesn't have cardiac support. And I'll tell you that I did an echo and that, that echo was normal as the first portion of that algorithm. So then I moved to evaluate the plural line. And you can see here, R2 means I was in the right two zone. You can see his plural line on the, on the right side has a subplural consolidations. This was very classic of patients with COVID. The pleural line is not normal. He's got, you know, some B lines that you see here, but the lung is moving and sliding. Now compare that over here. So here's a rib. We're about half a millimeter below the rib. Here's the pleural line. And not only do I not see lung sliding, I see A lines, which tell, tells me that my imaging plane is appropriate. I don't see any B lines that are coming down to obliterate these A lines. So if we think about this, I see uh, do I see lung sliding? No, I don't. Do I see B lines? No, I don't. And I'll tell you that I scanned his whole left chest up and down and I did not find a lung point. And if you look at this, does this look like a lung pulse where it's rhythmic with the heartbeat? A patient who's tachycardic here, um, does he have a rhythmic motion? No, we do not see lung pulse here either. So. I was convinced that this was a pneumothorax. I was getting ready to needle decompress the chest when they rolled in with the, the x-ray tech rolled in. And I said, well, what the heck, you might as well get the x-ray because no one's gonna believe me anyway. And um, look at what um, we found on chest x-ray imaging. So now to make my point, I needle decompress the chest um, his hemodynamics did get better. Remember what this looked like, uh, that it was a poor kind of no lung sliding, no B lines were visible. Um, there was no lung pulse. I couldn't find a lung point. Then we decompressed the chest here. This is in the left two zone. And now suddenly you see pleural irregularity, pleural sliding, um, and um, uh, you know, visceral and, and parietal pleural contact here. So this was kind of a very interesting case. And the next case I have is that of a 32 year old woman. She was 32 weeks pregnant. She had presented with premature rupture of membrane and contractions, had early fetal decelerations. And, the, and we were called by the OB team because she was really hypoxic. Um, and she was hypoxic. She was on five liters face mask. She was setting 91%. She was relatively hypotensive. She was definitely tachycardic and she was febrile. So they had already started her on antibiotics and started giving her fluids. So as part of this algorithm, the first question I had was, what's her heart doing? What's her heart look like? So we did an echo. And as you can see here, you know, her cardiac function is definitely not normal. She's got biventricular um, severe cardiac dysfunction. And um, if you think about these patients, you know, who are in heart failure, you are very familiar with the Frank Starling curve and how once they're kind of on the upper edge of the curve, um, uh, increasing their preload really doesn't do much to increase their cardiac output. Now, if we can put the Merrick Lemson curve on top of the Frank Starling curve, you'll also see that in patients who are septic, um, their extravascular lung water kind of curve shifts upward. And for that same area of this Frank Starling curve where maybe they may have had some 
improvement in their um, cardiac output, maybe not a lot. They have a lot of extravascular lung water um, that causes a large increase in extravascular lung water. And when they're septic, that, that goes up even higher. So now we're looking at uh, a point here. So whenever I have patients who are septic and then have cardiac dysfunction, I'm really concerned. We also have information you know, from uh, echocardiography that's longstanding that you can use diastolic assessments to kind of get a sense of what the cardiac filling pressures are. Um, and we have patients who, if their E to E prime is, you know, really greater than 14, we see a very nice correlation between that relationship and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. But, you know, um, oftentimes we have patients in this kind of gray zone that we don't really know what to do with. And this is when um, lung ultrasound imaging becomes really helpful. So in this patient, you can see her mitral inflow pattern is that of a, a restrictive um, diastolic dysfunction, but her E to E prime doesn't necessarily fit into the bill of, um, you know, being greater than 14 elevated um, uh, left uh, ventricular and diastolic pressure or left atrial pressure. So, um, huh, so what do we do in this patient? So now we're looking at her and we know that her echo is abnormal and that clues you in to really start looking to see does she have B lines and could this be pulmonary edema so then i did a lung ultrasound on her and you can see a very crisp looking pleural line diffuse um B lines everywhere there's no area of of, of uh, sparing um they're almost homogeneous and really kind of coalesced um, so she had significant pulmonary edema. And after this, we really kind of knew that we needed to get aggressive about supporting her cardiac function. So really know what pathologies are best for evaluating lung ultrasound. Pleural effusions, these are, this is what lung ultrasound was made for. Super sensitive, super specific for catching pleural effusions. For pneumothorax, lung ultrasound is very sensitive, so we can rule it out easily, but it's harder to rule it in. If you don't see lung sliding, make sure you go through the entire pneumothorax algorithm. For interstitial syndrome, it's relatively sensitive. You um, really have to compare the, the B line morphologies to understand what might be the disease process. And for consolidation, it's kind of sometimes can be a little bit hit or miss because the consolidative process really has to reach the pleura in order for it to be visible, but it can be helpful when it is visible. Always have a scanning protocol and use an algorithm to help work through your differential diagnosis. At the end of the day, ultrasound is just a supplement to your clinical judgment. We're all still doctors so and practice providers, so please um, use your clinical judgment. That is key. Um, I want to thank you so much for your time. Here's a patient who had COVID pneumonia. Look at how terribly um, jagged the pleural line is, these subpleural consolidations, diffuse beelines everywhere with some areas of, of sparing, but really kind of a white lung. This is pathologic interstitial disease, not just um, pulmonary edema, but underlying interstitial um, pathology. So um, thank you so much for your time. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions you might have, and I hope you have a great rest of your conference. That's excellent. Thanks, Dr. Nikovan. So uh, I think many of you use uh, lung ultrasound in order to assess issues with oxygenation, both in ICU, maybe emergency cases in the OR. Uh, it's very interesting to see some of the correlation across modalities, though. So I'm looking forward to hearing more in the Q&A.